railways of the Indian subcontinent have for years exercised a particular fascination for the traveller, and nowhere more so than in the northwest frontier of the old British Raj. Now part of independent Pakistan, the passes in Baluchistan and the Hindu Kush mountains used to form the twin gateways to India, important for the old trade routes from the west, but at the same time vulnerable gaps in the British Empire's natural defences. Invasion and plunder by the Afghan tribes was a constant thorn in the side of the British, who feared Russia was behind the Afghan attacks. The heavy losses suffered in the Second Afghan War in 1880 led to renewed pressure for efficient rail transport. The immense cost of railway building in this difficult terrain was now amply justified, enabling troops to be rushed to the front by rail. The railway through the Bolan Pass was one of the most outstanding pieces of railway engineering of the colonial era. The pass had proved a formidable obstacle to railway builders after an earlier meter gauge line had to be abandoned due to landslips. The present route on a new alignment was opened in 1894 and the imposing design of the tunnel entrances reflects the pride the British took in it. A nice touch was the naming of one of the portals after the chief engineer's wife. We were permitted to place our camera in the nose of a diesel locomotive to obtain a unique view of this fascinating railway with its bold engineering. For several miles, the ruling gradient is 1 in 25, or 4 percent, making it one of the world's steepest main lines. The abandoned tunnel, just visible on the right, belonged to an earlier railway swept away by storms in the 1880s. In steam days, the 12 coach Quetta Mail had to be powered by no fewer than four locomotives to get it up the steep grades of the pass, making it the most expensive route to operate in the whole of India. Not surprisingly, the Bolan had top priority when diesels became available. The steam locos were hastily retired when these 2,000 horsepower Alco diesels from the USA took over in the 1950s. The Alcos have been on the line ever since and are now themselves considered period diesels. Although the railways in the mountain passes were modernized several decades ago, it is a different story in the plains of Sindh and the Punjab. The narrow meter gauge trains, which proved so useless in the Bolan, continue even today to serve the semi-desert regions of the Sindh. Mirpur Kas is the junction for the meter gauge lines which once formed part of the Jodhpur Railway in India. The great attraction here for the connoisseur of old trains is that the line's original locomotives are still in use. This is a YD class 282, 
a design that first appeared in 1928. At the loco shed at Mirpur Kass, one of the YDs was under repair. The frame of number 729 wasn't just cracked, it had sheared completely on both sides. It seemed rather a hopeless case, somewhat beyond the meagre facilities of this small shed. Inquiring whether it would be sent to the main workshops in Lahore, we were assured it would be fixed on the spot and put back into traffic the next day. This seemed wildly optimistic, but as it was one of only two mechanically sound YVs available, they had no choice but to try it. Lying around the yard were more YDs, all suffering from even worse problems, while another was already loaded up on a mainline wagon awaiting shipment to Lahore. This M-Class 460 was the station Shanta. Built in 1913 by the North British Company in Glasgow, it was the last active example of what was once the most numerous metre gauge class of loco in India, with over 700 built from 1903 onwards. This lone Pakistani survivor had outlived its Indian classmates across the border by 25 years. Number 63 here struggled desperately over a simple shunting maneuver in Mirpur Khas. The ramshackle charm of the railways here lies not only with the trains, but with the stations and infrastructure as well. At Jamrao Junction, the traveller is bid heartily welcome. English is still the official railway language, informing the signalman which of his ancient levers to wrestle with. The branch train from Judo arrives with the one remaining active YD class engine in charge. The driver takes the chance to rinse off some desert sand while waiting to cross the evening train to the terminus at Cochrane Park. To our surprise, the Cockrepa train had another YD loco in charge. This was unexpected as the shed master at Mirpur Kass only the day before had been emphatic that only one was serviceable. As it steamed sedately past us, we could hardly believe that it was actually number 729, the very same loco whose two fractured halves were still being welded together just 24 hours earlier. The 
shortage of serviceable 282s had forced out of retirement some old passenger 460s. Nearly as old as the shunting engine at Mirpur Katz, they dated from 1920. The branch lines in southern Sindh are little used nowadays owing to road improvements and the train to Judo only runs once a day now. This tiny handful of waiting passengers was unlikely to make its trip viable. The most loyal remaining passengers were the women. The railway tradition of the ladies only carriage has obvious appeal in an Islamic state and is still maintained on Pakistan railways. The facility is of course unavailable on the local buses which nonetheless have succeeded in robbing the railway of most of its passengers. Even in their final years the old 460s could still put up a fair turn of speed despite their poor mechanical condition. Closure of the Sindh branches cannot be far off now, which will mean the end of the line for these fascinating survivors of the old Jodhpur railway. Moving north up Pakistan's desert frontier with India, we come to another enclave of steam operation, this time on the broad gauge at Samasata, the junction for a long cross-country branch that formerly extended to Amritsar in India. The area is called Cholistan, once an independent state, now part of the southern Punjab. This is the last stamping ground of the CWD class, the newest steam engines on Pakistan's broad gauge roster, delivered by the Canadian War Department of British India during the Second World War. Like all Pakistan's locos, the CWDs were adapted to burn oil after India's coal mines were placed out of reach by partition in 1947. first station out is the curiously named Baghdad. Here the local villagers queue up with their goods in the hope of persuading the firemen to let them have a few litres of hot water from the locomotive's boiler. This is now a quite unusual sight.
Despite full semaphore signalling, the crew also seemed to need a written train order to proceed. We were invited aboard by the loco crew and discovered the drawback typical of a wartime austerity machine. It was actually rather rough at speed. 35 miles an hour felt more like 60. Despite their good haulage power, it was no surprise they had been taken off the main line. Travelling north now, up to the Punjab, we come to the plains between the two main tributaries of the Indus, the Chenab and Jhelum rivers. The main railway centre here is Malakwal. Malakwal is home to these delightfully Edwardian four-coupled locomotives, the SPS class. Responsible in their day for the fastest expresses of the Indian Raj, they now amble peacefully around the backwaters of the northern Punjab with local passenger trains. At the turn of the century, inside cylinder locomotives were very common in Britain and on many European railways as well. Those at Malakwal are the remnants of a once vast fleet employed all over British India and are now the last in service anywhere in the world. Inside cylinder locos were judged not only better looking, but safer too, with the pistons and cranks tucked out of harm's way under the boiler. Malacoil's locos were built between 1912 and 1920 by the Vulcan foundry in Newton the Willow, Lancashire. A sizable workforce was constantly occupied cannibalizing withdrawn locos to keep the survivors going. Malakwal's Edwardian engines may be good looking, but elegance comes at a price. The inside cylinder configuration means that even the simplest mechanical repair can only be achieved by lifting the locomotive off its wheels. In constant use for running repairs at Malakwal is the depot crane. Steam driven, of course, and hailing from Ipswich in 1922. Steam maintenance is labour intensive at the best of times, but even more so with these locos. A large team of fitters spends a disproportionate amount of time engaged in lifting operations, rolling the heavy wheels in and out from under the engines before any work can be undertaken. The Malakwal fitters usually manage to keep about six locomotives serviceable at any given time, so about one train a day is still scheduled to be hauled by these Edwardian rarities on each of the five lines radiating from Malakwal. This country station seems busier than usual as the daily steam train crosses a tourist charter en route to Peshawar and the Khyber Pass.
although the local roads are quite good, long-distance travel is better by rail in the northern Punjab due to the shortage of good road bridges over the Jhelum River and other Indus tributaries. So the leisurely pace of the old SPS locos is not a problem. On board the charter, we had the opportunity to experience a vintage slice of Edwardian railroading from the footplate. The old 440 was delightfully smooth running, and we were able to examine at close quarters the fascinating inside cylinder motion normally invisible to the line side observer. This delightful signal box at Chalisa Junction is typical of the pleasant architectural surprises that greet the rail traveller along the way. As we travel north on the Khyber Mail, daybreak finds us crossing the great Indus River at Attuck. The fortified bridge marks the start of the northwest frontier province. Here onwards, the railways were built mainly for strategic rather than for commercial reasons. The main line terminates at the garrison town of Peshawar but a branch continues up to the Khyber Pass and the border with Afghanistan. As in Baluchistan in the south, the frequently savage attacks by local tribes obliged the British to garrison the area. They established a chain of forts right up to the Afghan border, but they were dangerous places for those who served there. Wherever the imperial troops had been ambushed, it became the custom to mark the place with the crest of the defending regiment. After the Third Afghan War in 1919, it was belatedly decided to construct a railway to assist the military. The difficult terrain had proved a bar to earlier efforts, but this time, just as in the Bolan Pass in the south, no expense was spared. 34 tunnels, four switchbacks, 92 bridges and culverts were built on this 34-mile line, which took five years to build. At the reversing stations, the track was laid with double crossovers to enable two full-length trains to pass. Full signalling was provided to give the line maximum operating capacity. At the summit of the pass was Landi Kotal, the last town before the Afghan border. Here, the tracks fanned out into a ten-track marshalling yard, complete with loading ramps. A whole regiment could have been rushed up here from Peshawar in less than a day. In the event, the 1919 Afghan war turned out to be the last, and these lavish facilities were never needed. The line led a humdrum existence as a local railway for over 60 years. But even today, all major structures are still guarded by the Khyber Rifles. The railway was closed as a precautionary measure in 1985 owing to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Tank traps were placed across the track in case the Soviets had any ambitions in the Khyber. That seemed to be the end for the Khyber Railway, but happily, it was not so. With the eventual departure of the Russians from Afghanistan, 
The threat of invasion receded and the Pakistani authorities decided to reopen the Khyber Railway for tourist excursions. Three HGS class 280s, the class that was originally used on the railway, were overhauled in Lahore and sent up to Peshawar. This was the same class of loco that used to work the Bolan. Their choice today is for practical rather than sentimental reasons, as the axle load limit in the Khyber is too low for the Japanese diesels normally used elsewhere in Pakistan. Regular rail traffic seems unlikely to resume in the Khyber, but tourist charters are popular and the Pakistanis seem keen to tap this market. After leaving Peshawar, the Khyber train has to pass through the market area to get to Jamrud at the entrance to the pass. On the first trip, this caught the stall holders completely by surprise and most of them just left their wares on the track. The 21 miles from Jamrud to Landi Kotal is operated as a single section now, and only one train at a time may enter it, a far cry indeed from the railway's original purpose. We shall now join the first advertised train in 10 years on the Khyber Railway. At the first reversing station, the station building is 25 metres above the track, as it serves two stations at once, Medanak and 50 metres above it, at the end of a two-kilometre loop, Changai. The switchback layout enabled the average gradient to be kept down to about 2.7%, or 1 in 38. This meant that no special locomotives had to be built for the line, 
and it could be worked by standard HGS 280s from the planes. Between the reversing stations, there are some incredibly steep catch sidings. It's not known whether they caught any runaway trains, but the results must have been spectacular if they did. At Shanghai, the train reversed again, and the loco crews took the opportunity to check the bearings of these old locos, which had not done any hill climbing for many years. They seemed to be putting up with the strain all right, and were soon ready to set off again for the long haul at 1 in 33 up to the Ali Mashid Gorge.
Ali Marjid is the narrowest part of the Khyber Pass and scene of many an ambush during the Afghan wars. The line is carried high above the valley floor by a succession of tunnels that keep the railway out of danger from the severe flash floods common in the pass. When the railway was built, the tribespeople were pacified not only by profit from its construction, but also by the right to travel on it free of charge. Closure since 1985 had denied them this privilege, but these young men made sure of claiming anew the rights established by their great-grandfathers 70 years before. By the time the train neared Landikertal at the top of the pass, it had become apparent that the leading locomotive was not steaming properly, and the rear one was doing all the work. By now, so many locals had leapt aboard, it was hard to see the assisting loco at all. So authentic was the train's appearance, one had difficulty reminding oneself this was actually a special for rail fans and tourists. On arrival at Landikotal, the train negotiated the unused 10-track marshalling yard and finally came to rest at the terminus. The first passenger train to come up the pass for 10 years. The date, January the 7th, 1994.
but the trip was a bit too much for leading loco number 2264. The reason for her poor steaming was a fractured blast pipe. The crew could not do much about it on the spot, but as the rest of the day's work was mostly on level or downhill track, it was not a great problem. The wisdom of having two locos on the train was well demonstrated. Meanwhile, the rest of the railway staff were concerned with the reopening of the station and were unloading its furniture. The station itself was constructed like a small fort in readiness for siege in time of war. The ticket window doubled as a machine gun post. The usual offices were grouped around an inner courtyard with the railway completely hidden from view. Outside the parcels office, a set of Northwestern Railway scales were still on hand to weigh goods and parcels, and the station master, Mr. Aman Ullah, took us into his office to show us how he used a shuttered rifle slit to keep an eye on the railway. The original station master's logbook was still there too, detailing the arrangements for the inaugural special on November the 19th, 1925, plus other minutiae of the line's existence in the years when it was part of the Northwestern Railway. Beyond the station, the railway continues through the streets of Landikotal. This is the extension of the Khyber Railway down the western side of the pass, right up to the Afghan border at Landi Khana. Secret surveys were made to continue into Afghanistan, but the military situation calmed down in the 20s and the plan was dropped. This 11-mile section was opened in 1926 and with a ruling gradient of 1 in 25, or 4 percent, was even steeper than the rest of the line. Without the Afghan extension, this part of the line was of little use, and as it was difficult to operate anyway, it closed in 1932, after only six years of service. But the track and installations were left intact and survive today, relics of an imperial past when the tribes in the Afghan plains beyond the Khyber Pass presented a real threat to the security of the British Empire. Back at Landi Kotal, the special had to leave promptly at 2.30 p.m. to ensure being clear of the tribal areas before dusk. Ali Mashid Gorge, the antics of the overexcited tribal children led to fears for their safety, and the train was stopped in a tunnel. Survival of the Khyber Railway depends on continuing support from foreign tourists. The Pakistan authorities have declined to reintroduce a public service on the railway, saying that it would be hopelessly uneconomic to do so. Only an assured income from foreign tourism can generate sufficient funds to keep the line in good repair 
and maintain a reserve of locomotives. If this is successful, other lines may become tourist attractions too. This would ensure the long-term survival of these Edwardian steam veterans in Pakistan after their withdrawal from scheduled service, which now cannot be far off.